Well, good morning. Sunday school, July 9th, testifying to the gospel. You know, this lesson is um, unique, I think, in, in the perspective of um, the Apostle Paul gets uh, arrested, and this is, this is one of his, um, one of the things that leads up to his imprisonment for long-term imprisonment. And you would think that it would be over some, something he said or something he did or his argument with someone, but, you know, what we'll find out in the lesson today, um, it basically was a misunderstanding that people had who didn't like him, and they were using the occasion to, um, to um, basically try and kill him. So we'll find out what goes on in the lesson. Well, last week we had Paul on his way back to Jerusalem, and he had stopped in um, Ephesus, and um, we find where he had um, made, said his farewells to um, the, basically the area, the people, the churches in, re, in that region, they came to meet him and talk to him. And we see how that after that, Paul sailed across the Mediterranean Sea to um, Caesarea, which is in northern Israel. It's, uh, it's still there. It's a seaport. And... Um, Paul later on finds himself in prison there, and um, I was there once, uh, <laughs> and um, there's an amphitheater, and some of the, um, the, uh, the port is still, is still there. Uh, it's ma mainly underwater. At that time, there was less water in the Mediterranean Sea than there is now, so either the land sunk or the water came up. We don't, you know, it's one of those things. And um, so, anyhow, um, Paul lands in uh, Caesarea, and as he is at Caesarea, Agabus, um, a prophet, comes to Paul, and he also foretells this, that whenever he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be bound, and, um, you know, he's not going to have his, he's going to have his freedom taken away. And, of course, everyone's uh, advising him, including Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke, who was there, uh, said, you know, you don't go to Jerusalem, just stay here. Well, Paul um, did not flinch from that. He felt that it was his mission to go to Jerusalem and to take the offerings that he had collected from the churches in, in, um, in the Mediterranean area and, and Achaia and those areas, and they had collected an offering for the church in Jerusalem because Jerusalem was under a drought, and the people, the church in Jerusalem, they were, you know, they were having great difficulty. So um, Paul had received an offering, and he was now taking it to Jerusalem, but everywhere he went, people were telling him, this is what's going to happen to you whenever you get to Jerusalem. Now, one of the things that we look at here is, People said, well, you know, you know, in hindsight, we could look at this and say, Paul should have listened. <laughs> he should have listened to these individuals that were telling him not to go, because look what happened. Well, Paul already, Paul knew he was supposed to go to Jerusalem, and he knew that trouble awaited him there, and, and, and people said, this is what's going to happen to you, and, sa and Paul says, yes, and they say, they would say, don't go, and Paul said, no, I have to. This is what God has for me to do, and this is where I'm going, and I'm not going to back off from that, um, that uh, call that God has on his life. So um, Paul, he says, I will, uh, the will of the Lord be done. That was his, his um, declaration to this warning not to go, but he was of a mind that said, and of a spirit that said he had to go, and he says, the will of the Lord is going to be done, and I'm going. So that's how, he <laughs> that's, that's how it happened. So um, Paul's arrival in Jerusalem, well, it was a joyful occasion for the people in Jerusalem. James, the half-brother of Jesus, is the pastor of the church there, and um, they were quite excited to, to receive Paul, and uh, they were sharing the stories of what was going on in Jerusalem, and Paul sharing the stories of how that the gospel had been taken to the Gentiles. But uh, they, in verse 20, it talks about there were many thousands of Jews who had uh, come to know Christ as their Savior. But <laughs> Paul was also informed that a majority of these Jews still maintained that you had to be um, you had to keep the Mosaic law, go to the temple, and all that, 
in order to become a Christian. They, the, these, in, these large number of, of Jews, did not um, agree with Paul uh, about um, Paul's declaration of the gospel to the Gentiles. And so they, even though they accepted Christ, these thousands of people who came and were part of the church, they were still um, under the law and influence of, of Judaism and the priests. And Paul was saying, no, gee, he wasn't against those things. He was just saying Christ came to fulfill them. So, and we'll see as we go through the lesson, Paul participated in the temple um, ceremony cleansing and doing the, the, the same rituals and rites that he had done before. So, um, but, the, but the Jews that were now Christians, they were vehemently against Gentiles being, um, being Christians and, and coming to know Christ. So that's kind of the setting that we have for our lesson. In Acts chapter 21, verses 26 to 30. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple. So he purifies himself just the way he had always done, and the way you're supposed to whenever you're going into the temple. He went through the, the purifying rites. You know, he didn't bypass any of that. So um, to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. So there was a period of time, I believe it's about a week, um, that they had to do this purifying process. Yes, verse 27. And when the seven days were all almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and uh, basically against the law and against this place, the temple, and further brought Greeks into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. Well, none of that was true. <laughs> you know, none, um, you know uh, and, and the facts of the matter is Paul didn't do these things, but these Greeks uh, who were Jews that had been following Paul and stirring up the, stirring up the crowds and bringing people against Paul, well, they saw Paul in the temple, and so they just, you know, they went spastic and started, you know, yelling and screaming, and it could do, they could do about anything to um, get people riled up, and especially the idea of a Gentile coming into the temple. So Paul listened carefully to these leaders, the Jerusalem leaders, and they advised him to give the Jewish Christians a, some, some sign of his loyalty to their traditions. So he wanted to, and so what better way to show the, the converts to Christianity that he uh, wasn't against um, the laws and the clean ceremonial cleansing, things like that. So this was Paul's way of showing his loyalty to the, to the, the new converts or to the Jewish Christians. So evidently Paul did not feel the time was appropriate to make an issue of all this opposition that they were feeling towards him. And so um, he agreed to accompany four men to the temple to take vows, praying publicly, fasting, and making customary offerings at the end of the week-long purification process. So Paul's showing the people that, you know, hey, I'm here. I'm not against what's going on. So many Jews from other cultures were in Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. But so were Christians in Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost because that was when the Holy Spirit, uh, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit had descended upon them. So it was a special day for the Jews because this is the time that Moses received the law on Mount Sinai. And um, this was the time that the Holy Spirit descended upon the upper room and Peter and those, the 120. So Paul was going about his worship quietly <laughs> when uh, some Jews from Asia um, who opposed him everywhere he went, they saw him in the temple and they had plans to get him out of the way. <laughs> I thought that was a neat way of saying they wanted to kill him. Um, so they began speaking against Paul, why, telling people falsehoods about him. The accusations were either completely falsehood or half-truths. Paul was, never was against the Jews, neither was he against the law, 
Um, what else? Paul was not against the temple either, for he often worshipped there. And he also knew it was strict, strictly against the Jewish law to bring Gentiles into the uh, temple. So when these people saw Paul in the temple, they assumed that he had brought a Gentile into the temple. They didn't see the Gentile, but they decided um, uh, <laughs> that he must have brought him in. Well, you know, what better way to get people, uh, the, the, the people who, you know, don't believe that are non-believers in Jesus, but they're the, the, the Jews, the strict Judaism, what better way to get them in, in a riotous mood is to accuse this man of bringing a Gentile into the, into the temple. So just because Jews had seen Paul with um, Trophimus uh, and, Epic, Ep, and Ephesians, they assumed that he had brought him into the temple. And had, there, had this been true, um, Trophimus would have been the one stoned to death, not Paul, because it was the Gentile who was in the temple that needed to be stoned, not the one who brought him in. But they couldn't find, it. They couldn't find the guy, so they just were going to kill Paul instead. You know, it's always nice to have somebody willing to stand up for you. <laughs> the guy you brought in here isn't here, so we're going to kill you. <laughs> so they were, um, how can I say, they were, they were just anxious to try and get rid of Paul. And as they went about to kill him, verse 31, um, tidings came unto the ca chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating on Paul. <laughs> so, so the chief captain came near and took him, took Paul, and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. So Paul then, this, this, this captain, and, and notice it says uh, centurion, so there's two, at least two. So the, and a centurion is one over a hundred men. So there's at least 200 Roman soldiers <laughs> pouring into the temple uh, to, to squelch this crowd of people. And um, as he's there, he is, uh, he is bound with two chains, meaning uh, perhaps he was one, one, two guards and one on each side bound him, you know, like handcuffs, but they weren't handcuffs. Um, see, the, the Jewish temple was... The, the large area. Now, there's one that has the temple and then it has the fort on the side of it with its towers and stuff. Well, what you have over here in the Fort Antonio is the barracks of, of the Romans. And, okay, if we look to the, the fort was, okay, off to the left is the temple. And the temple's huge. I mean, it's just this massive structure. And you can see the towers that are overlooking the temple. The temple's on the left-hand side, okay? So the, on this picture, the temple's on the left, and those are the towers that the Romans uh, would be in to watch over the, the temple because the temple was the hot, the flashpoint, you know? If anything was start, if anything was gonna start, it generally would start in the temple. And so the soldiers would be watching the temple area and whenever this, this mob takes, on, takes Paul on, 200, at least 200 soldiers pour out of this, these, uh, this fortress down into the temple. <laughs> so it kind of gives you a picture of um, you know, what's going on. And uh, so the temple's off to the, to the left here, you know, in this area uh, over here. That's the, the temple where the, they're... Um, they're at, and the Fort Antonio is the fortress, and, and you know, it houses thousands of soldiers, and that's where they pour out of and down into the, down into the um, temple area, and they arrest Paul, and Paul is headed, they're taking him back into the fort <laughs> to protect him, and he's, he is uh, chained between two guards, one on each side, and they have him, you know, in chains, and the people have backed off because um, they stopped beating Paul. <laughs> it's a, kind, of a, kind of a picture you always you hear of Paul being beaten and stoned and flogged and shipwrecked. 
You know, it's just like, <laughs> he just continues. So what happened then, you have all this confusion going on in the riot, and, you know, whenever there's people yelling and screaming, they're gonna, they need to kill him because he brought a Jew, the Jew brought a Gentile in, that's all they needed to know, and they're gonna kill the guy because he needs killing. <laughs> you know, it's just, just the way it is. Uh, so they were taking him um, somewhere out of the temple, but not completely out of the temple because they didn't want to take him out into the street. They just took him into a side area and uh, they were going to kill him. But anyhow, there's uh, where Jesus was um, tried and, con and convicted is just up the wall where the temple is, the fortress is, it's kind of all one law, wall, and further up the wall, for the wall of, of city of Jerusalem, is where um, Herod's porch was. And Herod's porch was outside the wall facing down into the Kidron Valley. And there's a, there's a platform that was there that um, he would have stood upon. And then when Jesus was flogged, he would have been taken off of the porch, down the steps, inside the walls of the city and there he would have been flogged and people who were um, wanting to kill Jesus and crucify him they were all outside the wall because they couldn't get in where the king uh, was where he lived they couldn't get in there so he took care of it from there but anyhow uh, so they stirred up the crowd there were um, there was a great uproar the handcuffed Paul and the captain was unable to ascertain anything <laughs> so he arrested Paul uh, he didn't know who started the riot. He just knew that Paul was the one who was going to suffer the consequences for it. So they arrested him. And uh, when Paul is, verse 36, he states, For the multitude of the people followed after, crying, Away with him. <laughs> you know, just like they did with Jesus. Uh, so they were, they were crying out, Away with him. You know, let's, let's, let's kill the guy and get it over with. Verse 39. But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city of Sicilia, a uh, citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. So Paul is pleading with the captain, you know, who has him under arrest. He says, let me talk to the people. So they're on this stairway back up into the fortress. And so Paul has, you know, has the, has the uh, captain to stop. And, um, and that he could talk to them. So whenever uh, Paul explained to the captain that he was a Jew and also a citizen of Tarsus, and he speaks, uh, he wants to speak to the crowd. So the surprised captain probably decided to let Paul do this, hoping to learn more about the situation, why it was that it was so important for them to kill him and that he had stirred up the crowd. Um, Cilicia is the way it's pronounced. Cilicia. Um, so anyhow, I am a, I am a man, this is 22, 30, 22 verse 3. I am, a, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering unto prison both men and women. So Paul is letting them know exactly who he is. So these Grecian Jews had come in and stirred him up and got this all going. So Paul now wants to give his testimony. Okay, this is what has happened to me. I want you to know who I am. I, I am I'm a Jew, basically Pharisee. I was taught under Gamaliel. The, you know, and most of the, probably most of the Pharisees that would have been in the group, they weren't even educated the way that Paul was. So, and Paul goes on that he is zealous towards God and, a, and against the Christians, you know, to the point of persecuting and, and um, killing them. So, um, even executing some of the Christians. Then verse 4, 6, excuse me. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? 
And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. So Paul is giving them his testimony. And they're, they're listening. <laughs> you know they're listening because they're not storming the guards. <laughs> so they're listening to what Paul has to say, and it seems to be going rather well. Um, he's you know, talking about his Damascus Road experience and conversion and Jesus and things like that. Verse 12. And one Ananias, now he's talking about how that he then went to Damascus, and there he met Ananias. A devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight, and, and the same hour I looked up uh, upon him. So Saul's telling them, you know, I was blinded. Christ saw Christ, blinded me, and then um, we find where Ananias prayed for him and he recovered. Um, he, he uh, what else we got here? Take, God had taken away, I, I like this part, God had taken away his mission to of killing the Jews, or Jew, killing the Christians, to being a, a, a uh, evangelist for the Christians. So completely changed his, for Christ and changed his mission. So, and he said, verse 14, Again, all along, he's building this relationship that he has with the Father, I mean, with, um, with, the, with the Jewish people and their, their rites and rituals that, are in the, and that they, they conduct. You know, he's still presenting that to them. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen me, or thee, that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witnesses unto all men that hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So this is Ananias letting Paul know, you know, this is God, you've met Jesus, and now it's time for you to, you know, be baptized and um, be a follower of Christ. Verse 17. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. Now, the events that happen here in, in uh, Galatians, we found out that it's been three years. Okay? This isn't like he's on the road to Damascus, he's blinded, sees Ananias, he's healed, ends up going back to Jerusalem. No, it's been three years since he was uh, blinded and saw Ananias, and he went off to be with the Lord, with Jesus in the desert to, to be taught by the Holy Spirit, to be taught by, by Jesus himself. So after that, he comes back to, after that experience of being away three years, then he comes back to Jerusalem. Um, I came back to Jerusalem even while I was, pr while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And saw him say unto me, Make haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. So this is Paul's first, first um, time back to Jerusalem after his conversion. Three years have passed. He's in the temple, and God appears to him again. Uh, Jesus appears to him again, tells him, Get out of town. <laughs> You know, people aren't going to be receptive to what you have to say. Verse 19. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue, and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. So they know that I beat, I, I killed and beat uh, the Christians that would believe in you. And when the blood of the martyr Stephen was shed, I was standing by and consent, consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. So Paul is kind of having this discussion then with Jesus in this vision or this trance that he says he, that he is having. Um, and he's recounting you know, what he had participated in, what had happened to him, what he had done and what he had participated in, and even to the point of standing by and watching someone be stoned. Um, and he said unto me, you know, hold, he held the raiment, 
for those who were stoning Stephen. Verse 21. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Let's light a stick of dynamite and throw it into the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> that's all he had to say was Gentiles wow and they gave him audience unto his word unto this word and they, they listened to him until he said Gentiles <laughs> well yeah, let's blow up the place Paul and um, the audience listened to this point and they lifted up their voices and said away with such a fellow from the earth for it is not fit that he should live <laughs> so there they're taking him, they're going to take this man down. And so even doesn't matter if there's 200 Roman soldiers, they're going to take Paul out. The soldiers brought Paul inside the, the castle and ordered him to be interrogated. <laughs> um, it's interesting, it's not interesting, but whenever the Romans interrogated you, uh, you often didn't survive. <laughs> just, just the way it was. Um, they... Um, be interrogated with torture by being beaten with a whip. A prisoner typically fainted under the blows and frequently died. During Paul's ministry, five different times the Jewish leaders gave him 39 lashes. So Paul was a, I mean, you know, his back must have been like a plowed field. I mean, 39 lashes five times. And I'm sure they didn't go about, let's heal this up for you, Paul. <laughs> His, the scar tissue on his back must have been horrendous. And so they, they did this five times, and, and I'm sure that these guys are looking at Paul. They're going to they're gonna beat him again, and uh, it's like, I, I see you've been through this before. And uh, we also know that three times he was beaten with rods. So five times with uh, whip and, and, and three times with rods, and we know that as caning. They would take those the, the, and just beat on you, and, you know, it was... It was worse, um, I don't know if it was worse than whipping, but it was, it was, um, if it, they were both tied for equal, equal pain that they produced. And so Paul had, Paul had been a part of that, you know, that had happened to him in his uh, testimony. Well, Paul decides he's not going to go through that again. <laughs> I don't, I don't need to be beaten an another 39 times. You've, you've survived five, why not survive six, you know? <laughs> Well, verse 29, Then straightway they departed from him, which uh, should have examined him. And the chief captain was also afraid. What happens is, somewhere in all of this, Paul's, um, Paul lets them know who he is, that he is this Paul of uh, Tarsus, and that he is a Roman citizen, and that he has rights. <laughs> well, uh, straightway they departed from which and examined him, and the chief captain also was afraid after he had, after he knew that he was a Roman, and because he had bound him, so it was it was illegal <laughs> and punishable to the Roman um, governor or, or the Roman centurion who would have bound up another Roman citizen, and we find that as we go through this that um, the Roman citizen, the, the, the centurion, who was, or the man interrogating Paul, was not a born Roman citizen. He was a, a person who had purchased his Roman citizenship at a great price. So even though he was considered a Roman citizen, Paul by birth was a Roman citizen. And he had more clout than the guy who was interrogating him because he was born a Roman citizen. Um, Paul replied, yes, but how could he be telling the truth? Um, the commander had paid a large sum uh, of money for a citizen. Paul did not look like he who would have been purchasing the rights of a Roman citizenship. So he had been dragged into the court, the outer court of the temple, and was about to be flogged, and he had suffered many indig indig indignities. And anyhow, we go on, and Paul is then um, taken to protective custody, and uh, that's where we, we have him, um, have him uh, staying. So I believe next week we have Paul 
what happens after this is there's a group that decide, they take a vow, and they're going to do anything they can to kill him. <laughs> and they're going to kill him before there's a, um, you know, a couple day span. They're, they put themselves, not going to eat or drink till Paul's dead. And so that's whenever the centurion or the Roman guard, garrison guard, sent him to um, uh, Caesarea. I mean, when I, when I was in um, Israel, the tour guide said, this is called Caesarea because Caesar built it for his own seaport. And um, the pronouncement in uh, uh, Cil Cilicia is how it is pronounced in the, the guy who pronounces it on, on the internet. <laughs> there's the, there's the, the, the temple, and on the left is where the, the holies of holies I, holy place and the holies of holies is, and this is kind of the outer court area, uh, where these column where these columns are, and the court the the fortress is right beside it, overlooking into the into the courtyard. So it's quite a a massive structure um, that they had for their soldiers. And then there's the courtyard, and these uh, this to the lower part here is the barracks. That's where all the, pe the soldiers would have stayed. And of course, they stayed within, <laughs> within the walls. Uh, and they had gates and things that they marched in and out of. Like I said, it, it housed thousands of soldiers. There's, there's foundation, there's stones that are the foundational work of where this would have been. That's, there's a, a road through the aqueduct there. Uh, no, I think it's an aqueduct. But it's, it's huge. It's like 600 feet <laughs> uh, down into that valley and goes ac across the Kidron Valley. Uh, I don't have a pointer, but um, I'll have to get me a pointer. To the left of the temple, so you have the Fort Antonio, and then this depicts it as being separated. But the fort was considered right next to the temple, and to the left of the temple, then, is the city of David. The city of David is where he, that's the old city, and that's where uh, David would have had his, his um, palace, would have been to the left of that uh, wall. Yeah, here's David's city here at the bottom. And there is a tunnel from the city of David, where is the pool? To the public square, wait, the, well anyhow, there's a, there's a tunnel that um, they, they dug through the stone, through, from the city of David underneath the temple, clear to the other side of Jerusalem. <laughs> so that was um, Zedekiah's, I believe, Zedekiah's temple, and they ran water through that. And they had, um, they had places where they would stop the water with, you know, ducks, you know, boards, and raise it up to let water go out to different areas of the city. But he, you know, so if they were under siege, they still had water to the whole city. <laughs> it was quite unique. They didn't find, they just found that a few years ago. I'm being quite good at this, the archaeological stuff, you know? <laughs> uh, but I know nothing really. But so that's just know what somebody else tells us. But what's that? Research. Yeah. But the the no that's the the true location of the temple. That's wrong. <laughs> now it there is a there is a group that is trying to. You can go back to that true the true location. Yes, there is a group that is trying to say that this true location of the temple is where it was, so that they can rebuild the the temple today, and you know uh, the, have a sacrificial system reinstated, rather than trying to blow up the dome of the rock and put it there, which was the 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 ancient temple or the te the temple of. Um, Jeremiah, when he goes back to rebuild Jerusalem. Uh, when Solomon built the temple, 
He built it up there where it's the Dome of the Rock, but they're trying to say now that Solomon's temple is right here where that true location is. And if that be true, then there's no, um, nothing blocking for them to b rebuild the temple uh, today, uh, which they are trying to do before Jesus returns. You know, that the fulfillment of prophecy that they will rebuild the temple. And uh, that's where there's a group of them saying that that location is the location and they're going to um, rebuild the temple there because they already have it started. The red heifer they're going to use for a sacrifice. They've done all that. And some say that they even have all of the rocks and everything cut to make the temple. But that's the argument that's going on now uh, where that location, where it's this true location, that's um, where they're saying w they could build the temple and it would be the original temple that was built by Solomon. But everywhere you step in, in Israel, is a <laughs> it's, a, it's a holy site. But it gives you an idea. It's interesting to, to see all the things and go back to the one with the temple wall, like where the wailing wall is. I think I pointed that out last week. Yeah, that's it right there. So that would have been the temple, uh, the, the big structure here in the, is the holy place, and the, the larger structure there, the holies of holies, that would have been where the Ark of the Covenant was, Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that budded in a, in a jar of manna. And that larger structure there is where God was supposed to dwell upon the seat of the Ark. Well, Paul is in this outer area here, and there's a big fight going on. People from the Atonia Fortress see it happening. They come down and rescue Paul, and they're going to take him up out of the temple, probably through that little corridor there, and he's got over 200 soldiers protecting him. <laughs> and uh, they end up putting Paul up on their shoulders and carry him out, out, of the, out of the area trying to protect him. So that's it. Ta-da! <laughs> and everybody said amen. <laughs> thank you, Lord, for your graciousness, your love and mercy. We thank you for how you provide, and Lord, how that history can be revealing as to what you have done and what you will continue to do to honor your promises. So we thank you for your blessing. Thank you for your gifts that work in our hearts and lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.